Hello and welcome. My name is Simone Nizel and I'm the Education Coordinator at Del Oro Caregiver Resource Center. Um, we are so excited to bring you tonight's event, Caregiver Accounts, where we'll get to dive into some stories and reflections from a real life caregiver. Um, this event is brought to you um, by a unique collaboration between the California CRC system and Del Oro Caregiver Resource Center. And tonight, our guest is Kate Washington, author of Already Toast, Caregiving and Burnout in America, which was released by Beacon Press earlier this year. I have my copy ready to go as well. Um, and um, I am just so excited to have this conversation with her and to share this remarkable book with the rest of you. Um, it really, this acclaimed memoir offers um, some really incredible insights, not only into Kate's personal journey, but also just the experience of being a caregiver, one of the millions of caregivers across California and across the country. Um, we welcome your questions and your comments. During the conversation, um, obviously I'll be talking to Kate, um, but you can drop questions and comments um, into the chat below. Um, this is a good space for you to um, you know, develop some solidarity with the other people who are on um, the call tonight, other people who are streaming this event live. And we will try to leave some time toward the end of the program to address these questions. So it's my pleasure to introduce Kate Washington, um, mother, wife, author, and speaker. Um, Kate was the former dining critic for the Sacramento Bee, um, as well as the local editor for Zagat Survey's Guide to Sacramento Restaurants. Suffice it to say, she knows food, um, and she knows um, she knows good food, and she knows good writing. Um, her writing has appeared in the New York Times. Time Magazine, Eater, Catapult, and many other publications. Kate holds a PhD in Victorian literature from Stanford University and currently lives in Sacramento with her husband, Brad, and two daughters. Welcome, Kate. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, it's such a pleasure to sit down and talk with you. Um, first of all, um, your your memoir already toast profiles your experience as a family caregiver for your husband brad who um, developed a rare a form of cancer and um, underwent um, stem cell therapy to which he had an adverse response um, i just want to start by checking in with you about how you are doing how brad's doing how your girls are doing yeah, thank you so much. Um, so as you say, he had a stem cell transplant in 2016. So that's five years ago now. And it's been quite a journey since then. He actually developed a second form of cancer really uh, quickly after the stem cell transplant. And he'd also, his reactions had been so intense. He'd lost his vision. He'd lost the ability to walk, to eat, um, and a lot of other complications. He's had a lot of rehab, um, PT, occupational therapy, surgeries for his eyesight. And so I'm happy to say that today he's much more independent, able to kind of manage his own care largely, though I still kind of think of myself as a care partner. Our daughters are older now. I have a teenager in high school and a middle schooler. Um, wow. So our family life <laughs> has kind of settled down. Um, and we've spent a lot of time kind of recovering from the ordeal of his illness, but uh, he is doing considerably better than than he was doing at the time about which I wrote the book. Thank you for that update. And um, I just want to affirm your comment about how you are you're still a family care partner, right? Um, and I think mm -hmm. in your book you mentioned that even after after the um, acute sort of crises, um, you know, hospital visits, emergency room visits, um, your role as a caregiver doesn't just suddenly end. Um, and that's, I think, important for the people who are with us today to hear. Um, I also need to acknowledge that the pandemic has occurred between the events that you detail in your book and our interview today. And I would love to hear from you how the pandemic has 
you know, affected your your lives, um, you know, um, your, especially your role as a, as a care partner? Yeah, the pandemic really kind of thrust us back into some caregiver patient roles that we've been moving, you know, trying to move through a little bit, not move past mm -hmm. necessarily. But, and I'm sure you, many of the listeners here tonight experience the challenges of caring for somebody with a chronic illness or a disability through the pandemic. My husband happens to be immune suppressed. He always will be as a consequence of the stem cell transplant. And so, you know, we went back to me interfacing with the outside world, you know, for us, the masks and the hand sanitizer and all of those precautions were kind of a return to something that we had to do quite a lot after his, um, after his transplant. So it felt a little bit like coming back to something we thought we'd left to some degree. And I think it's really interesting how the pandemic has affected family caregiving. You know, on the one hand, it's showed the importance of the advocate and caregiver role while also preventing a lot of caregivers from performing that role, you know, from seeing their loved ones if their loved ones are in an institutional setting or from advocating for them in the hospital. You know, so that's been really challenging, but it's also created this opportunity, I hope, for change on a kind of a broader systemic level. Wonderful. And I, I, I would be remiss not to observe that your book, even though it's a memoir, does deal a lot with the systemic challenges associated with caregiving. So we'll circle back to that. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up now. Um, I, I, I want to start with a question about um, about your personal experience. It was really interesting reading your book. You mentioned that you were in a relatively privileged position as a caregiver, um, which is not language I usually hear associated with caregiving, a relatively privileged position, but you still found it to be overwhelming. So my first um, question for you is what privileges do you feel like you enjoyed as, as a caregiver that maybe some people don't? I mean, so many in, in a lot of ways. My husband was a tenured professor at Sacramento State University when he became ill. So he had leave and support from his employer and excellent health insurance. And when he had to take a disability retirement, he has ongoing benefits. Um, we had some savings and resources um, that were inherited from my mom who passed away very early. Um, I am white, I don't have to contend with medical racism, which is a really challenging thing that a lot of members of different communities face on a daily basis in medical settings. Um, I have a higher le level of education. So in many ways that can enable me to speak the language of the doctors, uh, literally in speaking English. You mm -hmm. know, many people who are family mm -hmm. caregivers are perhaps not fluent in English. Um, so many things that that made my journey easier. I live in a major city with major hospital, you know, so I'm not coming from three hours away to get, you know, the, the medical care for a rare condition that my loved one needs. Um, so all of those conditions and having family support and help, you know, helped me in the journey. But I, one of the things that I really wanted to point out in the book is, you know, it's always a challenging journey to care for somebody you love deeply who is ill on an emotional level and those privileges and advantages certainly helped me and yet even so it became often hard to bear really challenging for a lot of systemic and personal emotional reasons and but i wanted to use the book and use the platform that i could get with the book to point out how much harder it is for so many millions of the 50 million Americans who are family caregivers and a little bit about what we could do with do about that on a broader level. Thank you for that. Thank you for that response. And I know that was a tough question to start with. Um, I think that there are a lot of people who are, are tuning in today who 
um, might not even be aware of some of the, the systemic issues that you highlight. And it's really interesting that you inflect that through observing some of the privileges that you had. And even so, there seems to be this universal um, sort of, there seems to be a universally challenging um, nature to caregiving. And so I'm curious what you feel, what challenges you feel maybe caregivers universally face, um, what, whether or not they may have some of the privileges or disadvantages that you just outlined. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I look at sort of maybe four common themes. One is constrained choice that a lot of family caregivers don't really have an option to say no. You know, a loved one starts becoming ill, you're going with them to the doctor, and before you know it, you're the person that they're turning to when it's discharge time, and it's like, oh, they need 24-hour care. And the medical system just kind of assumes that you're the one who will be doing that. And if you are the only remaining family member, the only one who lives nearby, there's often not a lot of free choice in the matter. Um, I would also say that the intense nature of people's medical needs now, which has really changed over the last few generations, people are discharged from the hospital in need of high level medical care at different times. My husband needed anti IV antibiotics. Families are being sent home tasked with wound care, with, with really challenging types of direct hands-on care that 40 years ago would largely have been done by nurses and the intensity of those needs the need for 24-hour care often is hard on people. You know, people don't have medical training to contend with that. There are huge economic impacts of caregiving. A lot of people have to leave work because we don't have paid family leave in this country, though we do have some in California. We're fortunate. We're fortunate here, and we don't have other economic supports for people who are serving as family caregivers. And then just the long-term emotional intensity that can really lead to burnout and sapped empathy and some of the challenges that I write about in the book. So those are kind of four themes that I would briefly point to that I think are really common across a lot of caregiving situations, regardless of the advantages or lack thereof that you know the, um, the caregiver enjoys, the caregiver and family, I should say. While, while we're on the subject of burnout, can you give us the um, the quick definition, um, you know, of burnout, of family caregiver burnout as you experienced it? What are some of the symptoms? Well, for me, it looked like a shorter temper, more irritability. I got really clumsy. I started like tripping over things. I was neglecting in a lot of ways my own health and preventive care because I was so busy taking care of my husband. So that was kind of a factor as well. Um, for me, the, there was a real drain on my empathy and the care, the actual caring that I went into caregiving to do, to provide to my husband. Mm -hmm. I was impatient and frustrated. And it was just because of the ongoing demands of the situation, you know, how much care was needed and how long that went on. I mean, and for me, it was intense, but only for a few years. And there are people, including I'm sure many of our attendees tonight, who are caring for loved ones for you know five, 10 years and longer. So that level of vigilance and needing to care for somebody for that length of time is really demanding. And there's you know just not enough resources to meet those needs. Thank you for that. I, I think this connects to your earlier point too, just about the emotional toll, the emotional and uh, challenges that caregivers face to burnouts associated with that. If you are constantly vigilant, as you say, for years and years on end as a caregiver, that's going to, um, that's going to exhaust um, you emotionally. And um, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've heard a lot of kind of language around burnout that's related to that as well. Um, you do such a good job in your, um, your, your book of um, walking us through, you know, kind of the real raw, um, the real raw reality of, 
of burnout um, and emotional exhaustion. And one of the things that you observe is that caregiving can, can set um, a person apart from others. Um, what attitude and relationship shifts happen when someone becomes a caregiver? And how does caregiving make it harder to relate to other people? Well, I think, you know, for those who haven't been through it, it can be hard to understand the intensity of the situation, the challenge of the emotions in the situation. Um, you know, for me, I experienced both rewards, but also a lot of negative emotions about how my life had been kind of taken over by this situation. You know, sometimes resentment, sometimes guilt for not doing enough. And feeling those things in a situation where at the same time, I often felt kind of erased in social situations. You know, I, I know I mentioned in the book several times, you know, people, um, and I'm sure many viewers will identify with this. There were so many social interactions where people started by and finished with asking mm -hmm. how my husband was. And mm -hmm. it was like, I wasn't even there. And it was like, I, I would like, to be asked how I was, but be at the same time, I wasn't really comfortable sharing the answer because, you know, you're supposed to be fine and coping with it and self-reliant and, and, you know, getting on with things as a caregiver. And I often didn't feel fine. For me, it really reminded me, and I was really fortunate, and I know this is not the story for so many, that my own caregiving journey did not end in grief and loss. But mm. the feeling of the most intense days of caregiving really reminded me of how I felt when I was grieving the loss of my mom. Mm. And that feeling where somebody would ask you, how are you doing? And I would just look and be like, I don't even understand the question almost. You know, mm -hmm. there is no answer that fits with how I'm doing. And it, it seemed almost inconceivable that the world was going on with its regular everyday business and in social situations often too, because my concerns felt so overwhelming, it was really hard to connect even with good friends over you know, smaller matters or things, their daily concerns. And that, to be clear, that was really a me problem in the, the context of the caregiving, but it felt really isolating. It felt challenging to continue connecting with people. So many, so many things that you've said there that are that are so rich. I want to try to I want to try to sit with a couple of them. First of all, you know, you say um, it was a me problem. You know, experience or you, coping with you know feeling alienated from people when they're talking about their day to day lives. But I'm curious about um, you know I'm curious about how um, there's this supposed to sort of um, mm -hmm. understanding of what caregiving um, should be. And you even used that language just a moment ago. Um, I think many caregivers feel like they're supposed to respond and behave in specific ways. Um, and in your book, you, you kind of explore some literary representations of caregiving um, from the Victorian era, um, which I really appreciated. There's a nod to Jane Eyre and Anne of Green Gables and all, all these other classics. But I'm curious how maybe representations of caregiving sort of contribute to this feeling or even this reality um, when you're interacting with doctors and friends and family as a caregiver of I'm supposed to be X, Y. <laughs> um, can you speak to that at all? Sure. I mean, I think part of the reason I looked back at these representations from the Victorian era is that in some ways the ideas of self-sacrifice and particularly gendered self-sacrifice from women, you know, are really epitomized in the Victorian era. They, they predate it and they post-date it, but that's kind of an era where those representations and were sentimentalized and really lauded. And I was really interested in writing the book, how those have echoed into our own time, which is a more feminist time, a more egalitarian time, and very different in terms of, 
you know, women's ideas about self-fulfillment and, and living for yourself and not needing to simply be a vessel for caring for other people. But truth be told, I went back to those books when I was in the thick of caregiving because they were old favorites and I didn't have the concentration to read a lot of new stuff. And, you know, I, I read Middlemarch every few years. It's like an all time favorite book of mine. And when I went back to it in those days, I was like, I can't believe I never noticed how many caregiving stories are in this book. And they spoke to me. And in that book, George Eliot, the author, is, is wrestling with ideas and stereotypical and, and um, you know, idealized visions of care and marriage and how women are supposed to act and how to be a woman and a person in the world. And it's, it's a really, I think, profound exploration of those ideas. Um, so it was important to me to pull some of those representations in to my mm -hmm. own book and also think through, you know, what has come down to us from different stories, you know, and we, we see caregivers in movies, in literature, in other kinds of representations. And um, often, you know, they're, they're not the subjects of the story. So I, for myself, I wanted to write something where the caregiver was the subject. And it was mm. so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I thank you for that. And I appreciate that you, you mentioned, you know, first of all, that these books are, are like old friends. You didn't have the bandwidth necessarily during the thick of caregiving to, to read new content. Um, one of the things that we hear often from caregivers is that it can be difficult to focus on on reading and and writing and communicating um, when you're trying to deal with so many things that are related to a loved one's care. Um, so I appreciate I appreciate that authenticity. I and I'm I'm glad that you. Um, have observed that there's maybe a need for more um, raw uh, storytelling or representation of caregivers and that you you meet that in this book. Um, so I, um, let me, let me see here. Do you, are there any representations today um, in modern literature, art, media, of caregiving that you would say do it justice would be helpful for maybe some of our viewers to check out so that they they can see maybe themselves and their their journey is mirrored back to them. Oh, that's so interesting. Um, you know, there's some really there are some really interesting recent novels that touch on caregiving. There was actually one called The Caregiver that's that's actually about a care worker. At really in that mm. relationship that I thought was was so interesting and well done. Um, reaching back a little bit further, I was really interested and had kind of forgotten that there's a pretty strong representation of caregiving in um, Alice Walker's *The Color Purple*, and that was an mm -hmm. interesting one in that some in that a woman who's really oppressed actually finds herself a little bit in caring for somebody. Um, who she comes to love very deeply. And that I found a really moving portrait of caregiving while also still being, you know, realistic, not not idealized. Um, hmm. I was thinking also recently a film that I thought was really interesting around caregiving is um, The Farewell uh, with Aquafina, who plays actually a, a dramatic and somewhat comedic, but largely a dramatic role. <laughs> And that has a really interesting like representation of, of a different cultural approach to caregiving. And I did want to say, you know, caregiving is so culturally inflected in different, um, different cultures, uh, different countries. It takes very different forms and has very different expectations around it, perhaps than, than we have here. So, I mean, those are just a few off the top of my head, but there's more and, and more in the book as well. Yes. Yes, the book offers some really great suggestions for um, for other other articles and and books that you know were part of your research. But I found myself taking the um, the deep dive into some of those um, while I was reading. Um, 
So I, I want to switch gears a little bit. At one point, you observe that the the medical establishment, as we see it in in America, um, has increasingly outsourced relatively complex at home care tasks to family caregivers, often with little training. This is a direct quote. Um, what were some of the mm -hmm. complex tasks that you faced as a caregiver? And how did the lack of training um, contribute to the strain or burnout that you that you felt and you described in the book? Yeah, well, the first time my husband came home from the hospital after um, his initial chemo, he had a collapsed lung and was a really high risk for infection. He was also on oxygen and he'd, he'd gone into that hospitalization seemingly fairly healthy and it turned out he had incredibly aggressive cancer and um, it was kind of a shocking turn of events. And they sent him home needing these IV antibiotics and he had a, a PIC line, an external line in his arm. And I was really surprised to learn that like when he needed IV antibiotics, there was no nurse to come and do that. It was me doing it three times a day. Um, and, you know, I, I got adept at it. It wasn't really the most complex task, but I remember shaking with nerves the very first time. And I was really aware that, you know, this line that was in his arm goes straight to his heart, that I was responsible for cleaning it, that it was my job not to introduce an air bubble or mess up the order of the the very specific order of flushing the line, which I still remember the acronym, it was SASH, uh, saline, <laughs> uh, antibiotic saline heparin to lock the lock the line. And Did you, you know, invent I got, that acronym? Or no, you, no, the, you, the nurse okay. <laughs> who trained me told it to me and it's it's a, a thing that they, that they say. And um, I did get a training from a nurse and this, um, he needed the, the IV antibiotics every eight hours. So if you'll mm -hmm. notice, doing something on an every eight hour schedule, if you actually do it on time, it does not leave you enough time to get a full eight hours of sleep in between those things for either the patient or the caregiver. Um, and that was the first time that he needed that kind of more complex medical care. Later, after his stem cell transplant, he needed um, IV nutrition every night, and it was a complicated pump that needed flushing and a new battery every night and to be hooked up to him. And it took a good 20 minutes to hook him up. And I'll never forget that when he had the discharge conference for that, one of the transplant physicians said, when I said, you know, this seems like too much to handle at home. And she said, oh, you know, you just plug it in. Some of our patients do it themselves. And my husband at the time was blind could not walk. I had been advised that he needed 24 hour round the clock attendance. He had neuropathy, so his hands shook. He could not have plugged in that line to his own chest because by that time he had a chest board any more than he could have gone out and run a 5k the day after he came home from the hospital. It was completely unrealistic. And, you know, I got trained and I learned to do it, but it was a real eye opener. And I've since talked to so many people, so many families who are doing far more complicated and, and challenging tasks than what I was given. And these are tasks also, especially in something like wound care, catheter care, colostomy care, that, you know, if they're not done correctly, pose a real danger to the patient. And people have the best intentions, but caregivers have to go to work to earn money to care for their uh, care recipients. You know, they, you know, not everybody has medical training or can has the space to even store the medical gear that they send home with you. It's, it's a really high expectation. And I know it has, you know, there's always a push to get people back to home, back to home, out of the hospital and out of institutions. But you know, I've come to really realize that that comes with a cost and that's often a cost that shifted directly onto families. It is no longer a cost borne by the healthcare system and it's hidden behind closed doors in individual families. Yeah, um, I remember that moment in, in the book, that moment, that encounter with that particular doctor and the just plug it in 
kind of offhand comment. And, and, you know, it, um, I think what you've said, what you've highlighted about how, um, it, how overwhelming and scary it can be for caregivers who don't have the extensive medical training, but are being tasked with these sort of these procedures that may seem simple from the perspective of someone who's had a lot of medical training, but not someone who is living day in and day out with their loved one and, and, and doesn't want to hurt them. Um, I, I wonder, do you, in, after having written this book, do you have any ideas or insights? It sounds like the nurses that you worked with, you know, they did the very best they could to prepare you, but is there anything else that the medical system could do to equip caregivers to, to do this work? Or is that even a reasonable ask of family caregivers? Well, you know, I'm, I'm of, I'm of several minds, I think, about that. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that there's a flip side to the being tasked with these high level expectations. And that is that often when the patient is in the hospital or in the care of the medical system, the family caregiver is not actually so much respected and treated as a full member of the care team. Mm -hmm even though we often have invaluable information, you know, can give insight into how our loved one is actually doing. Um, and a lot of other, you know, we can bring a lot of strengths to the table. And, you know, for me, there's a question of like inclusion from an early time so that the medical system can really appreciate the home setting what um, you know? What challenges might be faced, and not brush off families who may have really legitimate concerns about the safety of their loved one. I remember when my husband was being discharged. You know, we have stairs leading into our house. There's no way in or out, and he, like he really struggled to even walk on flat ground, let alone climb stairs. And when he was being discharged, I was like, "It's too early. He's not ready. He needs more rehab." And the the Jug juggernaut of discharge, just the wheel just kept turning and I could not stop it. And I think that, you know, considering the patient's full context, family life, social life is something that if the medical system is going to continue this push for home, and it seems really clear that they are, they need to think about some way to do realistic home assessments, realistic family assessments that take the actual capabilities of the patient's family into account. And I don't just say that for the sake of caregivers. I say that for the sake of the safety of the patient. You know, mm. it is mm. it is really important for the medical team to understand. Actually, just the other day on, on Twitter, I saw somebody saying like, wouldn't it be amazing if doctors still did house calls and could actually mm. understand the conditions that their patients are living in and what their patients really need based on seeing them in their own environment. And I think there's such a disconnect between the hospital or the medical office or the clinic and the home. And it's just kind of this unbridgeable gap at this point. Um, and I would love to yeah. see it bridged. Yeah. Um, you know, Kate, I, I you and I have, have talked um, uh, here and there um, before tonight, and I, I want to acknowledge that you know you you have a, a very clear appreciation for um, the medical staff who saved your husband's life, and um, we know that this pandemic has um, certainly um, put our, our our frontline workers through it. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I get the sense that um, from you that it's not that you are you're I get the sense from you that you see a systemic um, sort of problem. Um, and again, your book does this great job of balancing between your personal experiences and these larger phenomena that you observed and researched. I. I, I want to just I want to just take a moment to acknowledge that 
um, you you do such a good job of 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 highlighting how great um, your doctors and your nurses are. But within this system, there seems to be this like the caregiver seems to get kind of lost in this system um, at times um, or sidelined when they're so integral to providing care. Um, how do you think that how do you think that policymakers and leaders might be able to um, uh, re redress some of the, the 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 challenges that we're we're seeing? How might they be able to come alongside caregivers and help them so that they can participate more fully, um, so that um, the the I just asked you a really, really large question. Let me back up and break that down. <laughs> I think I got too big for my britches there. Um, let me back up. Not at all. I do have one small place to start with just a little anecdote, if I could. Yes, um, please jump in. <laughs> yeah. So just recently, an, another family member of mine, and I was not the caregiver, had surgery at um, UC San Francisco Hospital. Mm -hmm. And his wife texted me a photo of... Um, a badge that she got in the hospital that said caregiver that she was to wear. And this, mm -hmm. I think this was a pandemic policy change to make sure that people had some kind of official status as not just a visitor. And it was clear that like, if she was in the hospital that she had been vaccinated and tested and was clear and, and had a role to play there. But I thought it was so meaningful to see this shift to giving an official status. And like that is, seems like a really small starting point, but it's a starting point. Like it's then, yeah. you know, when she's standing bedside, the doctor knows who to talk to about this patient's care. The nurses know, in addition also, of course, to the patient themselves. Um, you know, I think there's so many, uh, broader things that could be done within the medical system, but also at the level of policy and government. And, you know, recently I read um, another book by a, a physician called The Problem of Alzheimer's by Dr. Jason Karlowish. And I was really struck by his approach because he runs, um, he's an Alzheimer's researcher and runs a clinic and he sees it as having not just one patient when a new patient comes to him, he sees it as the clinic having two. You know, mm. the, the, the caregiver is part of the, the system that they're treating. And so I think there are mm. physicians and researchers working on this and trying to think about how to integrate caregiving and, and make this issue more sustainable for families. I would also point to there's a care, a clinic for cancer caregivers where the caregivers are the patients in like psychosocial oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. Um, so there's some exciting innovations happening in that field and in bringing caregivers in more and acknowledging their role on the care team. In terms of other kinds of policies, there are so many things that could be done to support family caregiving and families going through medical crises and medical emergencies that maybe we can turn to that are outside the medical system. <laughs> but, I agree. Uh, and I, I appreciate that you. about those. Yes. Thank you for rescuing my, my <laughs> very long-winded and convoluted question. I, I really appreciate that anecdote. I love that you observe that just by just by labeling the caregiver, giving them a status within this environment that can kind of help to facilitate communication between all of the, the stakeholders involved in a patient's care um, and put yeah. caregivers on a little bit of an equal footing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I would just contrast it to an anecdote I tell in the book, which was a resident um, addressing me over and over as Mrs. and then using my husband's last name, which is not the same as my last name. And I felt mm -hmm. so erased and so disrespected mm -hmm. because it was like, that's not even my name and you did not ask. <laughs> and it was kind of like the opposite 
<laughs> you know, the opposite of feeling just like just an appendage to him mm. that soured the relationship. And, you know, we did not work well together because I was mad at <laughs> that so, position and I. Certainly. Thank you for that. Um, we'll circle back to the policy question a little later sure. on. That's, that's a big one. Um, but I, I, I'm glad that you brought us here to this erasure. You said something earlier in our conversation um, about, about grief. Um, and I want to acknowledge in the book, you talk about how um, as someone from Generation X, you know, you grew up with these expectations of, of having it all, having a career, having a family, being able to do everything. And um, when you were thrust into this caregiving role, um, some of those promises, some of those expectations um, kind of fell flat. Um, parts of you that you cultivated, you weren't able to, to really... Um, you weren't really able to express in the same ways. And um, you found yourself being erased in certain situations, as was the case with this president. That certainly is, is that certainly is something to grieve, right? Um, loss is not just, not just about the loss of the, not just in terms of um, an individual passing away, loss can also be related to loss of a, of, of a role of, of expectations you had for yourself. Can you speak a little bit more about how grief is at the core of, of caregiving? You make that claim at one point. Yeah, I actually, um, one of the things that I found in researching the book and was really surprised by is that even the word care has grief as its root word. Like I, I assumed the English word care came from the Latin caritas, a, a form of love, but it, it actually came from a Germanic root, meaning like wailing and grief and, and lamentation. And I was so fascinated with that because to care does mean to risk losing something. And that comes with, with grief. And you know, for so many, as I acknowledged earlier, the end of a long caregiving journey is grief and loss. And that is so painful in, in the sense of, you know, the, the death of the loved one. And for many people, especially in elder care, you know, they know that that's where it's heading. And that's a painful journey. And it's really hard to go down that road. But there's so many small and small and large losses along the way. You know, you, you Often as a caregiver, you lose your daily routine. Your loved one has lost their health, their wellness, their expectations of certain kinds of ability. And so they're often struggling with grief and loss and pain around mm -hmm. diagnosis and their changing life and capabilities. Um, caregivers and care recipients alike may be struggling with the shift in the relationship, you know, in my case, it was with a spouse and it really changed the way the marriage was and also our family life. You know, we weren't able to do some of the fun things we always envisioned with our kids who are little, you know, who were young when, when my husband was diagnosed, it really changed how we were able to raise them in certain ways. Um, if somebody's caring for a parent and there's that role reversal of suddenly they're in the more dependent role and the child is in the more parental role, you know, destabilizing that relationship is really challenging and painful and can lead to a lot of grief, grief and pain as you see, you know, a parent who was always like a, a guide or, you know, may have been a guiding force in your life fading away and, and you have to step in and take on that responsibility. There's just so many ways, big and small, that you know, I think many of us are changed by caring for our loved ones, changed by illness. And, it, you know, it's part of the human condition. We can't, we can't necessarily take that away, but I think we can acknowledge it and speak openly about it and, you know, maybe move away from the kind of, uh, you know, everything happens for a reason, 
um, you got to stay positive kind of view of things and acknowledge that it's hard and that, you know, just smiling through tears won't always fix that. The emotions will eventually come out. So part of, you know, what I wanted to do in writing my book was, was give kind of a voice and a face and I hope help other caregivers feel seen in the struggles that they're experiencing in their unique situations. What were some strategies that you used to, to cope with this grief? I, um, what did you, what did you do apart from revisiting, um, classics that you loved old friends? Um, what did you do? Yeah, I mean, I relied on um, a strong circle of friends. I had, you know, a, the group chat was invaluable. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, you know, some old friends. I had family I turned to often. I'm, you know, really I'm very close with my brother. Um, there, I, I was able to stay in therapy through most of the time Brad was ill and sometimes I had to cancel because, you know, his needs would take precedence. But I, I wish that that kind of mental health support or peer support in the case of a support group could be available for, for every caregiver mm -hmm. uh, because I think it's so important to have that outlet and that space for yourself. Um, especially in a longer, intense journey. Um, gosh, you know, there were also times when I was able to get away and have some respite care, and that was hugely important. And I know that's something, respite care has been a real challenge for people through the pandemic, where, yes. you know, the intensity of caregiving has not let up because no respite care was available and that you know i hope that that is coming back and available to people because just having a night a full day if you can't do more an hour if you can't do more but like you know a, a couple of days or nights to rediscover yourself and have some time without the the constant pressures and the mental load of caregiving i think is really really critical Thank you for that. All, all of those sound like solid self-care strategies. Um, I, I do want to return though to um, this kind of larger policy question as we're sort of approaching the end of our time together. You, there's this great moment um, in the book where you're, you're told, just take care, right? Um, that kind of mm -hmm. offhand comment that sort of, um, take care of yourself, right? Um, you, you write about how challenging it is, how even these measures that you've just described with coping with grief that can also be important for self-care, that those can be challenging to do when you're also balancing caregiving duties. What are some, what are some systemic changes that you, you think could help caregivers actually engage in meaningful self-care um, mm -hmm. going forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I always start with um, the question of paid leave because it is frankly such a crying shame that we do not have that nationally in this country. You know, I think we're the only or one of the only industrialized nations that, that does not. And it's before Congress now. So if it's something that you think would help caregivers or anybody, you know, call, call your congressman and uh, <laughs> congressperson, I should say, and, um, and ask about that. Um, because so many people, women especially, are having to leave jobs and choose between working and earning money and caring for their loved ones. And paid leave would help ease that. Um, I think that uh, better training, more job creation, and um, wage guarantees and better working conditions for paid care workers would have a huge impact for unpaid family care, uh, caregivers, that it provides more respite care, allows people to get the support that they need for their families and to keep their loved ones safe 
we're seeing an expansion of that in California, but it's being looked at federally as well. And as mm -hmm. over the next year, um, there will be an expansion of Medi-Cal in California so that more people will be eligible and that will enable more people to have home care workers and in-care supportive services. Um, in California, I would point to, we have this master plan for aging that's looking ahead to the fact that there's a gap in the availability of caregivers versus the number of elders who are going to need care over the next several decades. And one of the planks of that, it, there's five major planks and one of them is care, create caregiving that works. And I find it really hopeful that that's like being featured and looked at as a critical issue. And that that's really focused a lot on um, job creation for paid care workers. Um, I think better insurance coverage for more people or if we could possibly have universal health care that everyone could, you know, could stop having to um, scramble for, keep their jobs for, and, you know, com combat high deductibles and all kinds of things, you know, that, that our current system, I think, makes it really hard on so, so many families. Um, tax credits for caregivers would help ease the economic burden. There's so many, and then, then you know, we get into even more, you know, kind of pie in the sky uh, ideas that I <laughs> that I would love to see. And I, I write in the book um, a fair amount about, you know, in there's a conclusion that talks about what other countries are doing, and policy ideas that the U.S. you know could follow, but um, whether we have the political will is is still in question. So. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for giving us all of that good food for thought. I just want to take a moment now to um, check to see if we have questions that emerged in the chat. We don't have a ton of time left, but um, I think we have some time for one or two questions. Um, all right. Um, this question from one of our viewers on Facebook, how can um, the medical profession better support those that are being asked to care? So kind of more on more on that theme. Um, what are some other ways that the medical system can help caregivers? Yeah, I think one that would be really important would be deploying more social workers and like mm -hmm. social support services within hospital settings, you know, cancer centers, other clinical settings, um, and con working a little harder to connect caregivers and families to resources like Del Oro and like the other, you know, great community organizations that we have that do provide support and respite to caregivers you know those resources can often be hard to access or unknown and you know the medical system like that often i think falls between the cracks you know i i spoke earlier to you know involving caregivers more on the on the care team um offering kind of more respect maybe having a more formal role and i think those would all be great advances to you know one thing that i thought of is just, you know, start with, and I think some places are starting to do this, start with like a caregiver resource packet that really helps walk people through. And we had, I know when Brad was diagnosed, he had like kind of a introduction to the cancer center class. Mm -hmm. It was not caregiver focused, but there's so many like legal and financial things that you need to know, bureaucratic things. It took me ages to figure out just how the hospital worked. Like give people a fact sheet on like how to navigate the bureaucracy, <laughs> just like for starters, you know, there, there's a lot of things that could be done to make it more friendly and less opaque to people. And I think just for a lot of medical professionals and the system as a whole, bearing in mind, like they may be having another day at the office, but often a caregiver and their care recipient are having like the worst day of their lives or one of the worst days. Mm -hmm. And that disconnect, I think, you know, having empathy around that disconnect and, and really reaching out to see what can be done. And that's more of an individual and less of a systemic issue, but um, it's, a, it's a tough gap to bridge. It is. Thank you for that. Um, we've got 
Um, another question from Facebook. Can you share um, any other tips for that, that you um, for self care um, as a caregiver, given that time is just so limited? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I think, um, you know, really lean into the things that you love the most to have the self-care, the stuff that you really, really want to do, find the show that makes you happy and watch <laughs> that one, you know, like not the thing that's like the, the thing of the week, you know, if you can get that respite care and use it to have a massage or something that really takes you out of the headspace and helps you relax. If there's only a few minutes, I think meditation can be a really good tool, though it does, you know, it's maybe not appropriate for everybody, but I think it's, it's a good way to kind of keep that in touch with yourself getting, for me, it was really important to maintain some kind of exercise routine, even though it, it mm -hmm. fell away more than, than I would have liked. Um, and really drawing boundaries so that you can get sleep and, not feeling guilty about taking the time that you need. And I would also say asking for the help that you really need instead of the help that you think is like socially acceptable. You know, if, if you really need somebody, I had one time when a friend from my gym said like, what do you need? And I said, you know, what I actually really need is somebody to help me move some furniture because I had to move a bed around when my husband was coming home from the hospital. And it felt weird to ask for that, but I knew she was strong and I was like, I'm going to ask. And she came over and did it. And it was really helpful. And it was way more helpful than <laughs> another lasagna in my freezer. So, there you, go. you know, don't be shy about, you know, relying on your community. Thank you for that. Oh, Kate, it's been so wonderful talking to you. And if my earlier, you know, long-winded questions were any indication, like I could talk to you for another hour, but we are, um, we are coming to the end of our program today, and I just want to, um, I just want to thank you so much for for being here tonight, for writing this incredible book, um, and um, for for being so authentic and real about your experience, and also um, pointing to these larger systemic things that that we should consider in supporting caregivers and um and people who are are ill and disabled in our communities in our state and across the nation um with that um we are going to officially conclude i want to i want to make a quick plug for del oro and by the way kate thank you for slipping that in there <laughs> Um, oh, thank there you. Are <laughs> there are agencies like Del Oro that are here to help, and the California CRC system is unique in that um, your local CRC now um, is working alongside local CRCs across across the state. Um, we at Del Oro we're, we're one of eleven. Um, and we happen to serve um, California's gold uh, country counties um, or the greater Sacramento region. But our sister agencies are, are, are also working alongside us um, to offer opportunities like tonight um, where we get to sit and talk with someone who is just amazing um, and, um, and, and really um, dig into the experience of caregiving um, and, and the real issues. Um, so as we wrap up, um, if you happen to be um, in the greater Sacramento region and you are a family caregiver who needs support, our mission at Delaro is to improve the caregiver's well-being. We offer thing, everything from information and referral to respite to education and training. And um, we would love to connect with you um, and help um, in any way that we can. Um, you can also learn more about the California CRC system by visiting, uh, or excuse me, it looks like Delora's website is, has appeared at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Deloro, um, please visit www.deloro.org. And if you would like to learn about your local CRC or the larger statewide CRC system, please visit www.caregivercalifornia.org. And before we say goodbye tonight, we do have another upcoming event um, 
with the CRC system that may be of interest to you. Um, coming up in November, which happens to be National Family Caregiver Month, um, we will be doing a special um, event um, that is designed to help you to get to know the California CRC system, get you plugged into your local CRC as needed. Um, and you can learn more about this by, um, again, visiting www.caregivercalifornia.org slash event. Um, thank you again, Kate, so much for tonight. And thank you to all of you who are with us today. Thank you.